So like I mentioned earlier when we were going over the outline for these videos, our approach is going to be to analyze what we call a normalized filter first. So first we're going to design what we call a normalized filter. So this is a Butterworth filter whose cutoff frequency is equal to 1. And once we understand the properties and characteristics of this filter, then we'll learn how to scale this filter up to have a cutoff frequency that we actually desire. So what we'll do is we're going to let omega c equal 1, and if you return to the equation for the amplitude response, the quantity omega over omega c, now that omega c is equal to 1, just turns into omega. So in terms of the amplitude response of our normalized filter, it is written right here. It's just 1 over the square root of 1 plus omega raised to the 2n. So one thing that's interesting that we'll do here and we're, we're going to use is since this is the amplitude response, the amplitude response squared, by definition, the magnitude of something squared is always equal to the thing times its complex conjugate. So if this is the thing, I can put that here and then multiply it by its complex conjugate. Since there are no j's here, this really just turns into 1 over the square root of 1 plus omega to the 2n times 1 over square root of 1 plus omega to the 2n. So in terms of the amplitude response squared, what I actually have is just this quantity right here. I've just squared the amplitude response to get the amplitude response squared, and it's equal to 1 over 1 plus omega to the 2n. But keep in mind that this piece can actually be written as these two different pieces, their product. So it can be written as our original amplitude response times the conjugate of our amplitude response. So we're going to use that as we do some factoring here in just a minute. So let's talk about the Butterworth filter transfer function. In general, we know what a transfer function is. It's a quantity h of s, and this represents the impulse response of the filter in the Laplace domain, or s domain. And in general, s is a complex number that we write as sigma plus j omega. So when dealing with s, we like to write it this complex number in rectangular coordinates where there's a real part and an imaginary part. We also know that we can get the frequency response h of j omega from the transfer function by evaluating the transfer function along a certain set of points, namely the imaginary axis. So if we replace s with j omega, which is the same thing as saying let's let sigma equal to zero, then we can actually get the frequency response out of our transfer function. So given the transfer function, I can easily get the frequency response just by doing this substitution right here, letting s equal j omega. Similarly, if I have a transfer function and I want to get h of j omega, this is kind of the reverse process. Usually we think about getting h of j omega from h of s, since this is kind of backwards, we're going to go the other way. Well, I can, I can do that, though. This is just a, an equation right here. So instead of replacing s with j omega, I could rearrange this, and I could replace omega with s over j. So that would be a very legit thing to do. So if I actually have a frequency response written down, I can go back to the Laplace domain by doing that substitution. I can replace j omega, I can replace the omega with s over j. So this factoring that we had just a minute ago that let us write the amplitude response squared, I can actually write that in the s domain as the normalized transfer function times the normalized transfer function evaluated at a negative s. And if you go back to what we had written down for this, this was 1 over 1 plus omega to the 2n. Well, we've said to go from the frequency domain to the s domain or replace omega with s over j. So that's what's happened here. We've replaced omega with s over j. So this is another way that we can write the amplitude response squared of our transfer function as 1 over 1 plus s over j raised to the 2n. So let's analyze this quantity hn of s times hn of negative s. This quantity right here, which we said can be written as 1 over 1 plus s over j to the 2n. This quantity right here has a total of 2n poles. There are actually 2 times n places in the complex plane where this quantity goes to infinity. That's what we call a pole. And this happens any time the denominator is equal to 0, which another way of saying that is this happens any time the quantity s over j raised to the 2n equals negative 1. 
because if that quantity equals negative 1, on the denominator we have 1 plus a negative 1, which is 0, and then we have 1 over 0, and it blows up. So this quantity right here has poles that are located based on this equation, s over j raised to the 2n equals a negative 1. So let's rearrange this a little bit. If I do a little bit of algebra, I can rewrite this equation as s to the 2n equals a negative j raised to the 2n. So all I've done is moved the j to this side. I multiply both sides by j to the 2n. And I let negative 1 come right here, and negative 1 times j to the 2n. And then on the left side, I left s to the 2n alone. So all we've done is multiply this equation by j to the 2n to yield this. Now we can be a little more clever. This negative 1, instead of writing it as actually a negative 1, we can actually use this fact. A negative 1 can be written as e to the j times pi 2k minus 1 for any integer k. This is always true. This is always the point negative 1 for any integer k that you choose. Also, the complex number j, that's something on the imaginary axis, which has an angle of 90 degrees, or pi over 2 radians. So j, we can actually write as e to the j pi over 2. So if you use this fact and substitute negative 1 for e to the j pi 2k minus 1, and use this fact to substitute out j equals e to the j pi over 2, you can rewrite this side of the equation as this, e to the j pi times 2k minus 1 plus n. So after you make those substitutions, this is what you have. And now we can go ahead and finally solve for the values of s. What we're trying to do here is find out where these poles are. I almost have an equation solved for s, but not quite. This is s raised to the 2n. So if I take the 1 over 2nth root, so basically raise each side of this equality, to 1 over 2n, what I end up with on this side is s, and what I end up on this side of the equation is the same thing, except the exponent has been divided by 2n. So that's what I have right here, e to the j pi over 2n times 2k plus n minus 1. And notice this k is really a parameter. For any value k, this was true, so this is really my kth root. So the kth root, or the kth pole of this quantity that we've been investigating, has the form e to the j pi over 2n times 2k plus n minus 1. This is a complex number on the unit circle. So if I wanted to, I could use Euler's, and instead of writing it as e to the j pi over 2n, 2k plus n minus 1, I could use Euler's and write it like this to kind of make it clear that there's this real component that follows a cosine, and an imaginary component that follows a sine. And as we change the value of k, we're essentially just walking around the unit circle. And the values of k take on values 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 2 times n. So these are the pole locations of this quantity, where this quantity blows up, so to speak. So let's take a look at that. Here is a plot of the pole locations for a filter of order 4. I've plotted one, two, three, four poles here, one, two, three, four poles here for a total of two times four, which is eight poles. Here's another plot on the right. It's just a higher filter order. Same type of thing happens. For n equals seven, there are seven poles here on the right half plane, and there are seven poles here on the left hand plane, corresponding to the total two n poles that the quantity h of s times h of minus s has. So far, what we've been worrying about are the poles of this quantity, this product. What it turns out is that the left-hand plane, these poles right here in the left-hand plane, all of those poles correspond to hn of s. All these poles in the right-hand plane, those correspond to hn of minus s. The left-hand plane poles are the ones that we care about because poles in the left-hand plane correspond to a causal and stable filter. So really what we've done here is we have found the pole locations for the transfer function for the Butterworth filter that we want in the S domain. And this normalized filter has a total of n poles. We know what, where they're located. 
and we now know what this transfer function is. So at this point what we've done is we've actually developed an equation for the transfer function of the normalized Butterworth filter. Remember it's normalized because we started off under the assumption that omega c was equal to 1 and under that assumption we've been able to derive the fact that this transfer function has a 1 on the numerator and on the denominator it has n total poles. So that means we can write the denominator as s minus s1 times s minus s2 times dot 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 times s minus sn and we know where these are located. They're located on the unit circle at the locations given by the equation we had just a couple slides ago. If I wanted to, I could multiply all this out. Instead of having it factored, I could write it like this. So this is just going to be an nth order polynomial in s. And so there's going to be an s to the n, s to the n minus 1, all the way down to an s. So actually that's a little typo. That should be s raised to the n minus 1, not subscript. And it's going to have coefficients in front of all these. And since I know what this is, and I know what s2 is, I know what s3 is, and sn is, I know what these numbers are. So I know the numbers, these values, that are in front of my s variables. And it turns out that these numbers have a very special name. We call these nth order Butterworth polynomial, this bn of s. We can actually go look this up in a table. People have tabulated what these are because the pole locations for some filter order is just an equation. So people have tabulated for n equals 1 and n equals 2 and n equals 3 what this equation is and what these coefficients are. So we can go look it up in a table or we could just do this by hand using the math from the previous chart. So at this point we know what our normalized transfer function is. We know it has n poles. We know where those poles are located. And we also know it can be described as 1 over b sub n of s whereas b sub n of s is what we call an nth order Butterworth polynomial. And that's something you can just go look up in a table. So this would be fantastic. We'd basically be done if what we were wanting to design was a normalized Butterworth filter. But typically that's not what we want to do. Typically we want to design a low-pass filter that has a cutoff frequency that is not equal to 1. So in the next video we need to look at how do we take this design and scale it to have the appropriate cutoff frequency that we want for our specific application.